Hi. The first chapter in John Wenham's book, The Goodness of God, is entitled A Series of Stumbling Blocks. And the first part of it, he, he deals with the stumbling blocks of the Old Testament. And this is the, the idea that is presented by, uh, or the objection that is presented. If we accept the idea that the whole Old Testament was written under the inspiration of God and that its history and doctrine are true, surely this involves us in quite unworthy beliefs as to the character and conduct of God. The heroes of the Old Testament are utterly sub-Christian. Then he gives examples, Abraham being a polygamist. Jacob being cowardly, a liar, and a coveter. Samson being a sensualist. Japheth killing his own daughter. David being a murderer, an adulterer. The Old Testament describing God as a God, a jealous God. His being uh, uh, full of vengeance. Abraham offering to offering his own son in sacrifice or being willing to. The disobedience of Israel Israelites where they are swallowed up by the ground. Uh, the prophet Elijah having a hundred soldiers killed. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart being done by God. And the command of God to exterminate the Canaanites. These are all given as examples of sub-Christian um, behavior. It says the net result is utterly incompatible with Christian concepts. Okay. Um, the only sane position for the Christian to take, it is said, is to regard the Bible as the story of man's emergence from primitive false conceptions of God to a mature, enlightened understanding. It is one part of the whole story of evolution, the marvelous story of the progressive development of the universe under the guiding hand of God. The Bible is a true enough account of what men have thought about God, but in parts it gives a very untrue account of what God is actually like. The lower conceptions must continually be tested by the higher. So that's one argument that is given. Uh, Bernard Shaw basically ad advocates crude pantheism. In one of his publications, a story, he writes, clear-headed atheists who are content without metaphysics and can see nothing in the whole business but its confusions and absurdities, was his comment. Uh, others, it says, um, will allow a series of direct personal encounters between selected individuals and the personal God. But all have this in common, that the modern reader is required to distinguish between those parts of the Bible which rightly purport to give an account of God and those parts which wrongly do so. Some may call the process progressive revelation, but much of what is represented as revelation is no such thing. The book of Deuteronomy, for example, prefaces the command to slaughter the Canaanites with the words of Moses. Now this is the commandment the statutes and the ordinances which the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. Moses' adherents of this school will argue doubtless thought that this was God's will, but of course it was no such thing. A God of love could and would have taught nothing so cruel. It is a task of the discerning reader to detect such errors in scripture and to distinguish carefully between supposed revelation and genuine revelation. Most Christians would state this view in a more moderate form. 
but however moderately stated, it has a twofold difficulty. In the first place, how are we to know what to jettison and what to keep? Then he, he makes the point that others would argue that reason and conscience, since they are given us by God, are suffic a sufficient guide. Yet many have discovered by experience the fallibility of both. They have found that as their study has progressed and their spiritual life has deepened, their views as to what should be accepted and what should be dismissed have changed. Things which they once thought repellent and unworthy of the word of God, they now find to be deeply instructive. Things which they once thought ridiculous, they may now find to be important. This is the experience which Coleridge had in his study of Plato. He found himself utterly baffled by the apparent lack of consistent meaning in considerable parts of the Timaeus. I, I hope I pronounce things right. He, would, he could not, however, give a contemptuous verdict because all that he could comprehend impressed him with a reverential sense of the author's genius. He also remembered numerous passages, now fully intelligible, which had formerly been no less unintelligible. He concluded that the ignorance lay in himself. If this is the case with a great human thinker, may not the process be even more far-reaching when we are dealing with divine revelation. But it is said, is not Jesus Christ himself the very God-given criterion? The Christian does not judge the Bible out of his own head. His judgments are based upon his knowledge of the loving fatherhood of God, as shown in the teaching of Christ, the incarnate word of God. But here lies the second difficulty. Jesus accepted the Old Testament as true, authoritative, and inspired. Therefore, it is impossible to use the Jesus of history as a yardstick for criticizing the Old Testament. The only sort of Jesus who can be used for such a purpose is a ficti fictitious character. It seems wise, then, to see what the New Testament and Christ himself have to say on these matters which cause offense. So in the second, in the next video, we're going to deal with stumbling blocks of the New Testament. So um, in the previous video, John Wenham stated about apologetics and the validity of apologetics being two things. One, clearing away misunderstandings of revelation, and two, showing weaknesses of alternatives to it. This is how he proceeds through the book. He brings up the objection, the possible answers that people supply, but usually the answers are not satisfactory. I'm going to link to two videos. Uh, one is a Michael Green video on how we neutered the Old Testament and bent toward Gnosticism. And the second one is the first of four videos that David did on, it was called The Bible in Bits. I think this is also a contributor to why we misunderstand the Bible, is because we get the Bible in bits. We don't read it in context. We don't read straight through it uh, for understanding and, and getting the settings and stuff and the time period. We read sections, and then even when objections are introduced, it's usually in a section, not complete. So it's, it's part of the problem, I think, is, is the Bible in bits. So next time, the stumbling blocks of the New Testament.